Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfulin. When I'm not brahming until I finally stoke her, I'm here at Castle Wolfula reviewing movies. We continue Universal Horror Month with a review of Dracula. Z daughter, the direct sequel to Bela Lugosi's Dracula, released in 1936 and directed by Lambert Hillier, as old-timey a name as you can get. And thy body long undead, find destruction throughout eternity in the name of thy dark, unholy master. Horror sequels, and sequels in general, were uncommon in the early to mid-30s. The idea that audiences would go to see a continuation of an old movie over watching something totally new was still a wild notion. And it was, you know, for the best, ultimately. But Universal Pictures was in dire financial straits in the mid-30s. Carl Emley, the founder of Universal, and his son Junior had a reputation as gamblers, and they gambled on high-budget pictures that were often financial failures. Horror movies were always a safe bet for Universal, though, and sequels to their biggest horror hits were a no-brainer even at the time. So in 1935, Universal made Bride of Frankenstein to great success and acclaim, considered today just as good or even better than the original Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> So after that kind of success, it made sense for Universal to make a sequel to their other horror icon, Dracula. You're a wise man. There were some complications, though. Following the success of Universal's Dracula, MGM executive David O. Selznick purchased the rights from Bram Stoker's widow to the literary follow-up to Dracula, the short story Dracula's Guest. Dracula's Guest wasn't really a sequel, but actually the excised first chapter of the original Dracula novel that Bram Stoker reworked into a standalone Dracula story, published posthumously. MGM couldn't make Dracula's Guest into a movie of their own, though. MGM owned the rights to the story Dracula's Guest, but Universal owned the rights to Dracula in general. If Universal was going to make a sequel to Dracula, though, it had to use Dracula's Guest as source material. So Universal had to buy the rights to the short story from MGM. But if Universal didn't make a film based on Dracula's Guest by 1936, the rights would go back to MGM, putting Universal in a difficult position. Indeed. <laughs> It was basically just a scheme by MGM to try to undercut their competitor and force Universal to pay MGM for the privilege to make a sequel to a Universal movie. It worked, though, when Universal had to rush a Dracula sequel out at the last minute. The Dracula sequel was originally supposed to star Bela Lugosi returning to his most famous role, along with Boris Karloff and Colin Clive of Frankenstein fame in supporting roles. James Whale, director of Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, would have been the director. Whale wasn't very interested in making a Dracula sequel, though, and especially didn't like the idea of making two horror movies in a row. So he agreed to make the Dracula sequel on the condition that he get to make a non-horror movie beforehand. Remember last night, further delaying the already much delayed Dracula sequel. James Whale intentionally sabotaged pre-production of his Dracula sequel so he wouldn't have to direct it. Having the screenwriters submit drafts of the script that were too extreme and outlandish to ever be approved, one particular draft included torture and implied BDSM. Eventually, James Whale was taken off the picture and replaced with Lambert Hillier, who went on to direct the first ever screen version of Batman in the 1943 serials, Another Creature of the Night. Call up these rabbits, you Jap murderer! If you value your life, you better address me as Dr. Daka. Yeah, did I also mention that it's ultra-racist World War II propaganda? Are you Jap devil? But without James Whale at the helm, the Dracula sequel lost its legitimacy and consequently its originally intended cast. Even Bale Lugosi dropped out of the project for unknown reasons, but it was likely a mix of Whale leaving and Lugosi trying to avoid further typecasting. Lugosi only allowed his likeness to appear in the Dracula sequel in the form of a wax dummy. He really didn't want to be on the set of this movie. The Dracula sequel ultimately became Dracula's Daughter, bearing no resemblance to the story Dracula's Guest that it's supposedly based on, with no major stars either, and the film's production was rushed to the point that its screenplay wasn't actually finalized until weeks into shooting the movie. This night is almost gone. Who knows what another will bring. Despite the production difficulties, does Dracula's daughter still manage to be a hidden gem in the Universal Monsters canon? Here's my review of Dracula's daughter. But first, I have a message from my sponsor. Me! Pledge to my Patreon today to support the channel, help it continue to grow, and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday, and archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. 
pledge to patreon.com slash Dr. Wolfula if you're interested, and I thank you in advance. What's been going on here? Murder, my friend. Murder? Dracula's daughter picks up at the exact moment Dracula ended, and it answers the question of how can you get away with killing somebody for being a vampire? And the answer is you don't. You get fucking arrested. One bloke weltering in his blood with a stake driven through his heart. In Van Helsing's defense, Dracula became a wax dummy after he died, so it shouldn't really count as murder if the corpse isn't real. I shan't run away. Edward Van Sloan was the only actor from the original Dracula to reprise his role, but with a catch. His character is no longer named Van Helsing. It's Von Helsing now. Von Helsing, Professor Von Helsing? Why? There's no definitive reason for this arbitrary change, but Universal's contract with MGM while making this movie stipulated that Universal couldn't use any characters created by Bram Stoker that don't appear in the story Dracula's guest. So it's possible to get around this and bring back Van Helsing, they just slightly changed his name. Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. It's also why John Harker and Mina don't appear in the sequel, because you'd think they'd, you know, try to vouch for Von Helsing's innocence otherwise, but who knows? Maybe John Harker was just a giant dick. Surely you can't expect to face an English jury with such a defense? It's my only one. Anyway, though, the deaths of Dracula and the unnamed Renfield are pinned on Von Helsing, who was justified in his killings. This is just like the OJ case. In destroying the monster Dracula, I performed a service to humanity. But instead of getting a good lawyer like OJ did, Von Helsing opts to get a good psychiatrist, contacting and inconveniencing an old pal named Dr. Garth, played by Otto Kruger, who you younger kids will recognize from Perry Mason. Professor Von Helsing? Oh, he's in Budapest. No, he's in London. He needs help badly. Von Helsing needs Dr. Garth to prove Von Helsing's innocence as a character witness, corroborating that Von Helsing is totally sane and he really just killed a vampire and not some guy who liked to chill out in caskets. You must convince them of my sanity. If I do that, they'll hang you for murder. You can't murder a man who's been dead for five centuries. Dr. Garth trusts Von Helsing, but is hesitant to believe his former mentor's wild story until a certain countess shows up in town. You're up against stern reality. You can't defend yourself by quoting folklore. Dracula's Daughter isn't just some vampire courtroom drama, though, which is where the Dracula's Daughter comes in. Countess Maria Zaleska, played by Gloria Holden, who is depicted in a more sympathetic light than her pop, the Count. You will remember nothing. Maria didn't choose the vampire life. She was born into it and wants out, convinced that if her father's corpse is burned Darth Vader style, she will finally be free of her curse and live the life of a normal white woman in her 30s. Shopping at Target but not buying anything, returning open cosmetics to Ulta, going to Starbucks five times in one day, you know, that kind of shit. I can live a normal life now, think normal things. But it becomes clear that the Countess hasn't shaken off her vampiric ways. What do you see? in my eyes. Death. As her manservant Sandor urges because he prefers simping for goth chicks. So the Countess gets back up to her old tricks and here's where things get a little kinky. Now, in early drafts of Dracula's Daughter, the Countess was intended to abduct men and torture them. But her torture was going to be more on the BDSM side of things with whips and shit. And the Countess's victims would be into it. But this was 1936, remember? So of course that wouldn't fly. So instead, they just made the Countess a lesbian! Ah! You have beautiful hands, but they're so white and bloodless. They're cold, ma'am. Maria commands her servant to bring a young girl over to the Countess's art studio as a live but soon-to-be-dead model. My mistress is an artist. She will pay you if you will pose for her tonight. The movie isn't explicit in its depiction of a lesbian vampire, mind you. The Countess doesn't tell her servant Sandor to specifically bring her women that are menstruating. Like anything remotely naughty for the time, it's just implied. The intention was there, but most audiences at the time didn't catch it. I'm ready now. And you can get anything past censors as long as you're subtle about it. Bride of Frankenstein, released a year before Dracula's Daughter, had its fair share of homosexual themes in it, but that film handled it on a more of a subtextual level, or with winking humor. Dracula's daughter depicts same-sex interest in a more in-your-face way, at least for the time. Why are you looking at me that way? Won't I do? Yes, you'll do very well indeed. Lesbian vampires are actually a trope that dates back to the 19th century in literature. And you see gay vampires all the time nowadays. Just look at the Twilight books. Dracula's daughter just happened to be the first time it was depicted on film. Please don't come any closer. 
There is another unfortunate interpretation of this movie's countess, though. Her vampirism in and of itself is a metaphor for homosexuality, and she's desperate to cure it to live a normal life, seeking the counsel of Dr. Garth, a psychiatrist, to rid her of her affliction. You're the one person who stands between me and utter destruction. Homosexuality was long classified as a mental health disorder as a way to persecute gays and treat their sexual orientation as something to be cured, which is a perspective that unfortunately persists in certain circles to this day. This interpretation of Dracula's daughter has made the film polarizing in recent years, but you know, it's best to just take it at face value as a movie about a lady vampire who just happens to be into chicks and save yourself some sleep. Sometimes entertainment can just be entertainment. I need you, Dr. God. I need you to save my soul. Speaking of which, is Dracula's daughter entertaining? Eh, not really. But the same could be said about its predecessor by today's standards. The only thing the original Dracula had going for it was Bale Lugosi's and Dwight Fry's performances and the atmospheric gothic sets. The movie was kind of a snoozer compared to later universal horror films like Frankenstein. You think it takes talent to play Frankenstein? It's all on makeup and then grunting. Dracula's daughter has some gothic atmosphere here and there with a return of the castle set from the original Dracula, but the sequel doesn't have a Lugosi in it to hold it up. You're not in London now, Dr. Garth, with your police. You're in Transylvania, in my castle. Gloria Holden's character, Maria, works okay, and it helps that Holden really didn't want to star in a horror movie, too, because it makes her performance as a vampire that doesn't like being a vampire much more believable. There's blood on it again. It's just, the Countess isn't very compelling by herself as a reluctant villain. It feels like her character would have worked better as a tragic heroine alongside a resurrected Dracula, sacrificing herself in the end to stop her father or something. But on her own, the Countess doesn't do a whole lot of evil stuff worth talking about, and a lot of her dirty work is carried out by her henchman, Sandor, who seems to be the one actually calling the shots. The night is here. Why are you looking at me that way? I'm remembering last night and waiting. Dracula's Daughter was ultimately rushed out at the last second, shot with an unfinished script through much of the production. So, you know, it's understandable that it's kind of half-assed. Going out after vampires. Vampires? But I always understood you went after them as checkbooks, sir. The movie does have a little bit of humor to it to liven things up, especially with the relationship between Dr. Garth and his assistant, Janet. What do you want? Please come right away. This is the zoo speaking. The what? But really, the only notable thing about Dracula's daughter is the lesbian angle. If it didn't have that, nobody would remember it today. She's gone. She's taken Janet with her. Gone? Who's gone? Countess Aleska. Moving on to the finale, speaking of rushed, in the last ten minutes of the movie, the Countess kidnaps Dr. Garth's assistant Janet to try to draw the Doctor into a trap back at Castle Dracula in Transylvania. What do you want of Garth? His life in exchange for hers. In exchange for Janet's life, the Doctor must be the Countess's new partner as a vampire. Now, I know Dr. Garth has a bit of an Ellen DeGeneres thing going on for him, but Maria must realize he's a dude, right? With like a cock and balls, you know? Then let your science save her, or agree to remain here. Doesn't matter. Feeling betrayed, Sandor kills his mistress, and before he can kill the fuck out of Dr. Garth next, Scotland Yard and Von Helsing arrive to kill the fuck out of Sandor. Oh, Jeffrey. And the movie just ends there. Somehow an even more rushed ending than the first movie. The woman is beautiful. She was beautiful when she died, a hundred years ago. Dracula's Daughter was the final film in Universal's first cycle of horror movies. Carl Lemley and his son were unable to pay off the debts they owed after years of expensive flops, and the father and son duo were kicked out of the company they built. In 1936, Universal would no longer be the family-run operation it once was, taken over by the Lemley's creditors, the Standard Capital Corporation, with John Cheever Cowden named as Universal's new president, and Cowden hated horror movies. Dracula's Daughter was the last horror movie overseen by the Lemley. And under Cowden's regime, Universal wouldn't make another horror movie for three years, the studio's bread and butter, instead focusing on making comedies and westerns until Son of Frankenstein was released in 1939. Ultimately, even with all the financial and production turmoil surrounding Dracula's daughter, it still manages to be okay. Unremarkable, but not terrible by any means, and it's also somewhat groundbreaking in its content. Still, the Dracula sequel is not exactly a thrilling conclusion to the Lemley era of Universal Universal Horror. I give Dracula's daughter a Von Helsing out of Van Helsing.
I wonder who got to keep that wax dummy of Bela Lugosi. You could probably have a lot of fun with that thing. Vampires! Ha ha ha! This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.